Like two million other music lovers, I'm a subscriber to Rick Beato's Everything Music channel here on YouTube. I love what he does with what makes this song great, but what's really impressive is his ability to take music theory and teach it in a way that makes sense for all of us. Anytime I see him doing something along the lines of music theory, I have to tune in. Like this video here, Understanding Basic Chord Progressions. It's a little bit of a misnomer, but what Rick is really putting forward here is much more important. It's what chords will you see a composer use around a given key? And it's a lot more than just the chords in the key, but they're also not drawn from random. After going through some of the theory, Rick summarizes like this. If you just know what chords are in a major key, what the five secondary dominants are, and then go to the parallel minor and know what those chords are, I think about this. Let's look now Rick begins again. to you list out major, in order all of the different fine. chords that he's outlined above. The idea that these chords are coming from three sources is a great observation, and let's review what the sources are. The first source is the key itself, the diatonic chords, that Rick calls the primary chords. Second are the secondary dominants, and lastly we have the borrowed chords. In a key that is major, the borrowed chords would be from the parallel minor. Let's go back to the first category, diatonic. That's a fancy word. What does diatonic mean? So what diatonic means is twofold. The first is that it belongs completely within the key that you're discussing. So any note that you play or any chord that is made composed of notes, every one of those notes is completely within the key. However, there's a more detailed explanation as well if you look at traditional music theory, and the idea of diatonic is it's based upon the seven notes of the scale, that is five whole steps and two half steps. So what we would call major or minor, or in mode terms, Ionian and Aeolian. It would also cover Dorian, Phrygian, etc., etc. If you had a whole tone scale, for example, and you were playing notes that strictly belong to the whole tone scale, a lot of people would say, I'm playing diatonically, or this run is diatonic. However, in an official music theory standpoint, that would not be applicable because the diatonic implies this set pattern and not the whole tone pattern. But for the most part, when you hear the word diatonic, let's think completely within key. Rick also uses the term primary. Now, in traditional music theory, primary would imply the one, the four, and the five chord, whether in major or minor. Rick is using it here in a more broad sense, and that is any chord that belongs to the key, which I think is a fine use. But keep an eye on that primary might be used a little differently if you look at the traditional music theory texts. Rick outlines the seven chords that belong to the primary key, the diatonic. He also outlines the five secondary dominants. And last but not least, the parallel key, in this case, the parallel minor, and it's seven chords. In the key of C, it looks like this. Now listen carefully what Rick says after he's done counting his list. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. There are 17 different chords. Did I get everything? I got G minor, I got F minor. Let's go back to the list for a moment and check out Rick's count and let's see if that 17 is correct. If we count them a different way and say each of the keys has seven chords and then the secondary dominance is five, we've got seven plus seven, 14 plus five is 19. Now, one of the things Rick did is just not a clerical error. He just didn't bring down one of the Bs. So he counted 17 when it's actually 18. Why isn't it 19? Notice that the C can be the one. The C can also be a secondary dominant. So those two you would count not as two, but as one. So you'd have 18 chords. Yeah, but wait a second. What would you use to figure out whether the C you see in a chord progression is acting as a one or the secondary dominant. It could function as either. And then if you know a little bit about music theory or just what the name denotes, secondary dominant, when it's used as a secondary dominant, it's typically a dominant seventh chord. And then it hits you. Wait a second. Rick is talking strictly about triads here, three note triads. What about seventh chords? Seventh chords are everywhere. Why didn't he cover seventh chords? Is it because he doesn't understand them? <laughs> of course not. He understands them more than most of us. What about, did he forget it? I don't think so. I think he strictly didn't want to make it too complex. Listen to what he says. When you start uh, uh, trying to learn too much information at a time, it's not good. But this is highly problematic. 
Seventh chords are everywhere. Sure, there are some campfire songs that don't have seventh chords. Kumbaya, my lord, doesn't have seventh chords, but Home, Home on the Range, has two seventh chords. So we've got to take them into account anytime we're talking about chord theory. So let's go back to our key of C, and let's take our triads and let's bring them out to seventh chords. So in our diatonic key, we've got seventh chords that line up such as this. The one and the four, those major chords become major sevenths. The five chord, that major becomes a dominant seventh. The three minor chords, those are all become minor sevenths. And then the seven chord, the diminished, becomes a minor seven flat five. Now this brings up a great chord wheel principle that really has helped me in the idea that in each and every key there are one dominant seventh, two major sevenths, and three minor sevenths. Kind of the one, two, three rule. In every key, one dominant seventh, so if you ever see a dominant seventh, you know it can only belong diatonically to one key. There are two major sevenths, three minor sevenths, and then the diminished chord becomes a minor seven flat five. And yes, that would be another one, but you don't see that a lot in pop rock progressions. Jazz, of course, is a different story, but a great way to get started, the one, two, three rule. Let's go back now to our secondary dominance. When it gets to seventh, those are fairly easy. They're all dominant sevenths. It just across the board, when you think of a secondary dominant, it's almost always gonna be used as a dominant seventh. Now the parallel minor, we have the same correspondence to the majors and minors as we do with the diatonic key, but it's a little bit different. So in this regard then, the flat three and the flat six are gonna be major sevenths. The flat seventh would be a dominant seventh, and then the one, the four, and the five would be minor sevenths. And then last but not least, our flat two chord is gonna be the minor seventh flat five. Looking at all this in the key of C, here are all the chords that now, if we roll them out in the key of C, what we're having in terms of chords. And as you can see, we don't have 18 chords. In some ways, we have 38 chords per key. So this is what we need to take into account. We, the, only knowing the majors and minors is not gonna help us. We need to know the seventh chords as well. Now back to Rick. Okay, you just have to remember, if you can remember the first pattern, uh, major, one, four, and five are major, two, three, and six are minor, and seven is diminished. You can build everything off. The no, Rick, you can build everything off of there. Most of us, we can follow along a little bit with your theory if you're leading us through, but at the end of the day, we can't rebuild this for each and every key based on that simple formula. Yeah, you can. This chart, the simple chart, really, it's one, no, two, it, it's, it's, it's not a simple chart at all. It's a, it's a okay. fairly complex just, chart. Even if you don't count the seventh chords, the separate chords, you've got 18 chords per key to remember. There are 15 maybe common key signatures to remember. So 18 times 15, that comes out to, I can't even do the math in my head. This is in no way simple. And that's really the best way to memorize it is to study it every day and memorize it. I completely agree with Rick that this is one of the most important concepts that you need to know for chord theory, but I humbly disagree that the best way to do it is to memorize it and study it every day. It will take a long time for you to digest this information. Wouldn't it be better if you could just pick this information up, have it right at your fingertips tomorrow? And the bottom line is you can. Let's say for example, you wanna know in the key of A, what are all of these 18, no, 38 chords? And you need to know this right at your fingertips. Can you do that? I remember demanding of myself I needed to know this information. So, let's do it. Are you ready? Let's take a quick look at all of the different chords we're going to need to discover in the key of A. Here we go. In the key of A, the seven chords that are in the key, the major chords, E, a and D. E B in the five, A B in the one, D B in the four. The D is a major seventh, the one, A, major seventh. The E, the five, is a dominant seventh. The three minor chords, B minor, C sharp minor, F sharp minor, and B minor would be a minor seventh, 
C sharp minor, minor seventh, F sharp minor, minor seventh. The seven diminished is a G sharp diminished or a minor seven flat five. So there we have our diatonic chords for the key of A. Secondary dominance. You notice these two lightly colored outlines in the, in the chord wheel. These are the two secondary dominance you're gonna see by far the most often. The first one, five of five, is the secondary dominant of the five chord, five of five. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as a second major. Five of six, the other one you'll see most commonly, C sharp, so a B7, C sharp seven. These are the two primary secondary dominants. The other two secondary dominants are this chord here and this chord here. They're not outlined on the chord wheel because you don't see them as often. But if you think of it this way, this F sharp, just like the E up here is this, the dominant to A, B, the secondary dominant to E. As you can see, one cell counterclockwise on the chord wheel tells you where the secondary dominant it is. So for a B minor, the secondary dominant for a B minor, here's the B, this F sharp seven would be the secondary dominant for B. The same way, G sharp dominant seventh would be the secondary dominant for C sharp or the five of three. So here are seven diatonic chords, four secondary dominants, one, two, three, and four. And then the hidden secondary dominant, the one chord can always be a dominant seventh, which would be the secondary dominant, of course, for the D. So the five secondary dominants, one, two, three, four, five. Here's the natural dominant. What about the parallel minor key? So over here on the chord wheel, you'll see that the relative minor is a six. So in the key of A, the relative minor is the six. To find the parallel minor, all you do is look for the key that the six will be the one minor, an A minor. In the chord wheel, it's actually pretty simple. Just rotate three cells counterclockwise so that this moves here. Notice now the A minor is in the sixth position, the relative minor position. So once again, here we are in the key of A. To find the parallel minor, A minor, just click it over three, and now we have our parallel minor. So the chords in the parallel minor would be A minor, or A minor seventh, E minor, E minor seventh, D minor, or D minor seventh, G, or G seventh, C, or C major seventh, F, F major seventh, or B diminished, or B minor seventh flat five. So there we have all 38 chords in the key of A, right at your fingertips. So I walked through it pretty slowly that time to show you how easy it is. But once you've gotten used to it, you can see how quickly you could access those chords and know what sources they're coming from. One of the great things about the chord wheel is it makes it very easy once you've analyzed the progression to also transpose it. So let's say, for example, you have a, a vocalist that comes in that needs it at a different range. It's easy with the chord wheel to transpose that progression. So we walked through it slowly that time. Let's pick up the speed a little bit. What are the 38 chords that a composer might use in the three different categories in the key of F instead? And this time we'll go through it a little bit quicker. Here's the key of F. The primary chords, F, F major seventh, B flat or B flat major seven, C seven, D minor, D minor seventh, A minor or a minor seventh, G minor, minor seventh, E diminished, minor seventh flat five. The uh, five secondary dominant chords, the five of five is a G seven, the five of six is an A seven, the D seven, which is the secondary dominant for the G minor, because it's a G, so, D7 would be five of two. The E7, five of the A. The E7 would be the five of three. And then the hidden secondary dominant, F7, the five of four. So there we have our rotate three over. And here are our borrowed chords. F minor seventh, C minor, minor seventh, B minor, minor seventh, 
E flat, E flat dominant seventh, A flat, A flat major seventh, D flat, D flat major seventh, and the G diminished or G minor seven flat five. I think you can see why the chord wheel is the number one selling music reference title of the 21st century. This concludes part one. In part two, we'll go back to Rick as he analyzes Radiohead's Creep. We'll look at the progression, we'll analyze four other progressions and show how the chord wheel can help you with this most important task. In the meantime, I want to thank Rick once again for all the education and the entertainment. And when you can put those two things together, it's a true gift. In the meantime, as always, please like and subscribe. And thanks again for watching.